coming up on The Breakdown. Donald Trump's pants stole the show on Saturday night in North Carolina, but they weren't even the worst part. A discussion with our guest, the author of How Democracies Die, Stephen Levitsky, and an exclusive premiere of the latest Lincoln Project ad. Plus, we'll take your questions from Twitter. Use hashtag AskTheBreakdown. It all starts now. Good evening and welcome to The Breakdown. I'm Tara Setmayer and as always, the Rick Wilson is with me. Rick, how's it going? It's going all right. Um, We had a great weekend. Um, If anyone notices, I'm peeling because I spent a lot of time in the sun because we began celebrating my mom's birthday, which is today. So we start a palooza. In my family, all of our birthdays are always a palooza. So um, this week is Mama Palooza. So I wanted to wish my mom, who is wonderful, fantastic, and marvelous, a very happy birthday. So Um, Now that that's out of the way, let's remind our guests that if you have any questions for us, or viewers, I mean, if you have any questions for us, please send us hashtag AskTheBreakdown on Twitter as always, and we will try to answer some of them later on in the show. And the voicemail is back. We are reminding you all, we are keeping it up with the old school voicemail system. We're reintroducing it to you guys. We have a couple of messages. It's like a magnet for crazy. It's true. <laughs> I don't envy the person that has to listen to all of them because you get to listen to all these cool ones and then you have to like pick them out. And of course, there are some people who don't like us. And they leave us nasty messages. And I don't know, maybe one day maybe we'll play some of those, but with more good than bad. So keep the messages coming. We appreciate Indeed. them. And um, later on in the show, we'll play a couple. Um, so Rick, uh, your mic was off for a quick second. I didn't, I didn't hear how you said your weekend went. Did you do anything fun? You know, I, I actually had a great weekend and and there was one brief lacuna in the in the great weekend where I watched uh, the forever guy go on stage and creep out of his his bunker in uh, in, in Mildew Lago and, uh, and 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 bring us a preview of the 2024 election campaign. Listen, it took everything in me to not turn that on and not check my Twitter (laughs) on Saturday night. I told you we were in full mama palooza mode. And I said, I am not going to let Donald Trump fuck this up for me and ruin our weekend. So I did not watch it live. I could not bring myself to watch it live. We're in a new era. Our lives are not run by Donald Trump all the time, constantly. I said, I'll catch it on the replay, which I did. And it was hilarious and alarming at the same time, which leads us into our breakdown, breaking down the headlines. Um, you know, in the cold open, we, I made a, a kind of a little reference to Donald Trump's speech and the absolute freaking crazy, um, you know, like you said, he reared his ugly head all over again with this appearance in North Carolina. Um, I guess they rolled him out of, he's in Jersey now, I think. I don't think he's in Mar-a-Lago now. Yeah, he's up in bed. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think he, he's in Mar, he's in Bedminster. Apparently he's been commuting into New York, um, (laughs) which of course the, to, to lurk in Trump Tower. Right, all um, by himself. Yes, wandering the halls like a madman. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, it, it was, it was, uh, by the way, I'm, if my mic was off, I want to wish your mom a very happy birthday. Oh, and, she um, appreciates it. And, um, She's watching. And, and, and all the best. So, um, but yeah, look, it was, it was, it was disturbing. It was, it was typical. But I, and I want to make one point before we go in. We've got some video of it, I know, but I want to make yeah. one point to our, to our listeners. In 2015 and 16, America had a great failure of imagination. And they saw Trump going on stage and saying crazy things and saying bizarre racist things and saying things that were just, you know, to to the average viewer, alienating and weird and off and gross. But to a narrow slice of the electorate, he was feeding them the most delicious red meat they've ever tasted. And that's what he's doing again now. So people that's that true. watched him the other night and say, oh, he's lost a step or, oh, this is the same old, same old crap. And it's all that they should be very cautious to go back and look at 2016. And remember, when you fail to imagine the worst case scenario, it often comes true. When you, when yeah. you pretend that it's not happening, you know, I, I heard about a meeting a couple of weeks ago 
where uh, six or seven of the Republican wannabes for 2024 were assembled for this meeting with a, 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 an influential individual. And what I was told came out of that meeting was the, the person that hosted it says, oh, it was great. We didn't talk about Trump at all. <laughs> at their own and it peril. reminded me, it reminded me of Elizabeth Warren after one of those debates in 2020 or 20, 2020, where she said, oh, well, it was a great debate. We didn't talk about Trump at all when Trump was the only issue. That's right. And so you right. have to remember, he's still here. He is still present. He is still the the presumptive nominee for Republican president in 2024. You don't get rid of him by pretending he's not there. And he's going to make sure that people know that he's there. Because remember, Donald Trump's kryptonite is being ignored and being mocked. So as long as mainstream right. media and as long, you know, as long as he has his his enablers on, in the right wing media that will give him airtime, he will not be ignored. So the only other kryptonite is mocking him. So let's take a look at the nod and a wink that he gave to not only insurrectionists, but right. all the crazy that went on through that speech. We have a little mashup. Lincoln Project released earlier, earlier today. Let's take a look. Ah, oh, shit, we failed. Together we're going to defund our freedoms. The cancel culture, the defunding culture, the defending culture, and they defend the wrong things. Nobody ever thought what is happening would happen. We're going to take back our country and we're going to take it back at a level that is very, very good. You would have had a 1917 Spanish flu number. Shots or jabs as they like to call it. I actually like the other word better. Somebody sits down in a chair. If you don't sit down lightly, the damn thing would collapse. I never went on my ass. Biden has halted wall construction suspended removals and even removables, shredded our ground bake. I said, General, I might have to grab you, but I'm not going down under. I think that was a booby trap. Well, when did he do a deal? Oh, did he do another deal? Did he? They're going through every deal, every deal I've ever done. I am not the one trying to undermine American democracy. I'm the one that's trying to save it. guy was president of the United States for four years. If aliens were, came, were to come down right now and see Lincoln Project mashups and ads about Donald Trump, they would never believe that we were an advanced species because that freaking guy was the leader of the free world for four years. It's unbelievable. Now, in that mashup, you saw him make a couple of references about he didn't go on his ass and he was going to grab onto the general. Let's refresh folks' memories about that. Do you remember a year ago? Let's take a little trip down memory lane. Do you remember a year ago when Donald Trump gave the forced folks to come back to West Point in the middle of COVID so that he could give the graduations, um, the graduation speech there, um, the commencement speech, and he had a little trouble walking down a ramp? Well, the Lincoln Project made sure that we let Trump know we noticed, and we started a hashtag called Trump is not well, and it went viral. Trump saw it and didn't like it, and then he spent what, 20 minutes at the Tulsa rally trying to prove to people he could walk down a ramp and drink a glass of water? Well, here's the ad. Let's remind folks what we played last year. He's still talking about it. Something's wrong with Donald Trump. He's shaky, weak, trouble speaking, trouble walking. So why aren't we talking about this? And why isn't the press covering Trump's secretive midnight run to Walter Reed Medical Center? Why do so many reporters who cover the White House pretend they can't see Trump's decline? The most powerful office in the world needs more than a weak, unfit, shaky president. Trump doesn't have the strength to lead, nor the character to admit it. We're not doctors, but we're not blind. It's time we talk about this. Trump is not well. <laughs> we were being so petty, but that was part of the psyops that made Lincoln one of Project's my, work so successful last year. One of my Trump favorite is still talking moments, about it a year later. One of my favorite moments of that was I heard from a White House reporter the next the next morning who said, oh my God, they're losing their goddamn minds. They hope he doesn't see it, but he's probably already seen it. And within an hour, he had like torn the place apart. Like, how dare they? 
in the, you know, he, he apparently wanted to sue us like 57 different times right. during the election right, 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 for saying right. mean things about him. So <laughs> here we are. Here we are. Um, well, we're going to say some more mean things about him because, Rick, what the hell was going on with his pants? What? I don't Listen, understand. What was uh, happening? Was it an adult various, diaper? Various they astute, no, were they pull-ups? What, what was going on various, there? Various astute fact checkers have decided that he has a zipper. He doesn't have a zipper. Uh, all I posted when I saw it was, I have questions. <laughs> and I still have questions. <laughs> well, so because did Art. <laughs> He's a man happening? who wears a seven-foot-long tie. He, he, he obviously has some centaur in the wood pile because he walks with his like whole body forward. I mean, there's this, the guy has got the strangest physical affect that, uh, of any, of any president I've ever seen. And he's like this shambolic thing. And this suit is made out of some kind of this queen slick looking material. I got nothing. I don't know. Well, our our viewers had some thoughts. Not only our viewers, but the internet. The internet's had yes. some thoughts. Let's Come take to a me, look internet. At some of them. Yes. <laughs> From a blogger living in Mar-a-Lago, <laughs> starter pack. <laughs> a former blogger. Oh my god! I was today years old when I found out what FUPA is. <laughs> thanks to. <laughs> I am emotionally scarred. So thanks for that, Twitter. That was Joy Reid. <laughs> Southern living, and just like that, elastic suit <laughs> pants are selling out. Every GOP congressman will be sporting these. Diaper Don, that's very funny. Savage. Oh, this is one of the most ill sloppy, and clearly untailored suits I've ever seen on an adult. And he claims to be a billionaire. It's shocking, and that's without even dissecting his obvious speech struggles. Yes. Why can't he dress himself? <laughs> Oh my gosh. Mark Hamill, friend of the Lincoln Project. <laughs> He's clearly on the no-fly list. <laughs> Mark is really, really savvy with the Twitters. And my really favorite, is. my friend, Randy Rainbow. Oh, yes. He said, loving this vintage mermaid skirt by Halston. <laughs> yes, Randy Rainbow, nailing it with the vintage Halston reference, who is, um, if anyone hasn't seen it, check out the Halston series on Netflix. Amazing. Um, and shout out to Randy Rainbow. He's incredibly talented. If he you is. guys do not follow him, please follow him. He kept me sane and my household throughout the whole Trump presidency and the pandemic with his parodies of Trump and Republicans. He's incredibly talented. So Brilliant. shout out to my friend, Randy Rainbow. We got to get you on the show, Randy. Um, anyway, we're just having a little fun with this. I mean, because we kind of have to. Um, and the pants stole the show, kind of like the fly stole the show at the at the vice presidential debate. Well, the pants <laughs> stole the show. And, and when we were putting this show together tonight, we were like, the pants weren't even the worst part of that whole thing on Saturday. Right. right. It wasn't even the worst part of it. It gets worse. But even though we're making fun of this, I mean, the seriousness, though, is that this guy is still engaged in things that are really threatening to our democracy, which is why uh, I'm looking forward to the conversation with our guest after the break. Um, but sure. Trump continues on with the with the grievances. You know, everybody's out to get him. He is the he is the paranoia king. I was going to call him queen, but um, queens don't trust that terribly. But he is the paranoia king with everything. Everybody's out to get me. And he actually believed that there are booby traps being set for him. He actually said the words booby traps, like data from the Goonies. Booby traps. It's a booby trap. <laughs> Let's take a listen. <laughs> Got a Goonies reference in it. It's a good show already. What a movie. It's all a booby trap. It's all planned. It's all part of the deep state. Everybody's out to get them, setting booby traps. I can't. It's just, it's too much. Right you know, Tara, one of the things that, one of the observations I've long had of this guy is he at some point had this weird formative moment. I don't know when it was as a child in like 1950s television or, or, or early 60s television, whatever it was. And it shaped him in this strange way. And he has this whole set of cultural conceptions about things. I mean, the guy probably believes there's like quicksand in Central Park. <laughs> right. 
<laughs> that's right. Um, that's why it took so long for him to open the, you know, the rink there again because he had to dodge <laughs> all of the all of the quicksand booby traps out there. Uh, it's it's very odd. And and the thing about it though is that there are so many people that seem to think that yeah, that's right, that's right. Like they agree with him, which is the scariest part to me. You're always sure. going to have loony people, but it's the people that follow them and that you know prop it up that worry me. And there's way too many of those out there that you know, continue really to give are. him credence. And I just, I'm like, were they always there? What, what, like, what, where do these people come from? I don't know. It's, um, it's scary because it like, it's undermining our democracy. And that's what we're going to talk about for the rest of the show. After the break, we're going to talk to the author of How Democracies Die, Stephen Levitsky. And we're also going to preview a new Lincoln Project ad, which is amazing. So stay tuned for both of those. We'll be right at, we'll be right back. Well, they're burning the house down. Please protect yourself. Vice President, I'm speaking. This is an embarrassment. If you count the legal votes, I easily win. What the fuck? Have some faith, I'll make you a believer. And welcome back to The Breakdown. So our guest for tonight's show is Stephen Levitsky. He's a political scientist and professor of government at Harvard University. He is also the co-author of How Democracies Die. Uh, Stephen and I also work together on a PBS documentary series called Dismantling Democracy, which is actually up for a uh, local Emmy. And it's on Prime, Amazon Prime cheap plug nice. for our, our uh, Dismantling Democracy series that we worked with the UVA, University of Virginia as well. So very excited about that and excited to have uh, Stephen join us for the conversation today. Welcome, Stephen. Thank you for joining us. Well, happy birthday to your mom, Tara. Thank you. She will be very appreciative of all these lovely messages. She's uh, she's 67 years young and looks amazing. And so we, this keeps her young and vibrant. So I appreciate all the love for her. Um, so Stephen, I, you, you know, my voice may sound familiar since um, we never actually met in person because we did the documentary remotely. Um, but that documentary was so eye opening for me, um, even though I am engulfed in this every single day. But just listening to everyone put it all together, um, it, it just, it raised the hair on the back of my neck throughout the entire time I was recording it. Um, because this was last summer and it was after the Lafayette Square incident. Um, it was after Trump and the insane, let's, you know, shine bleach up your ass to get rid of COVID craziness. Like there were so many things that were happening that were culminating into this. And I'm thinking, what will our country look like? What were all? What would our democracy look like if we had another four years of this guy? And I know that you and your co-author were on CNN um, not too long ago talking to Anderson Cooper, and you said something that um, was very poignant. You you made the point that democracy has never been in more peril than it is today, even more so than when you wrote the book in 2018. Why? Yeah. Well, I should say. Um... I think our democracy was in more peril at the time of the civil war and the failure of reconstruction. So in our, in our lifetimes, it certainly has not been in more peril and it's in certainly in more peril than when we wrote the book. I think the biggest difference is that when we wrote the book, a lot of our focus was on Trump. We, we were very critical of the Republican party for enabling Trump, for not standing up and, and distancing themselves from Trump. Um, but we did not, view the Republican Party in 2016 as an anti-democratic force. 
And now we've come to believe that the Republican, the entire party is, is essentially an authoritarian party. It's become an anti-system party. So we're focusing a lot on Trump and there's good reason to focus on Trump, but it's beyond Trump at this point. And you could take Trump out of the picture. Trump, even if he were not the candidate in 2024, the Republican party would still be a threat to democracy. And that to me makes it a deeper, more long-term problem. This goes beyond Trump. You know, Stephen, I, I think that's one of the things that, that, is, that struck me what you just said. You know, they have essentially become kind of a revolutionary party outside of the traditional space of the two main political parties that have iterated through our history. And, and the, the, when you're a revolutionary party, isn't it true that they, they can, that, that's why they can do these things that are more transgressive or violent or dangerous, because they believe that, that they're in the midst of something that's existential, revolutionary, and and that you have to throw all the rules out to win, and winning is the only end state that matters. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I would characterize them as anti-system, uh, which means that they don't have that they they don't have a lot of qualms about messing up the status quo, because messing up the status quo at this point serves the interest of a good uh, chunk of their base, and um, that kind of frees them from the shackles of norms, of democratic practice, of worrying about what the majority of the electorate thinks about them, um, they, they have radicalized into a force that really is very, very dangerous to, to the basic rules of our democracy. Mm -hmm. Which is interesting because, um, you know, you, you, you've written about political parties and their role in keeping out authoritarians, right? And now we have a major political party in the, U in the United States that has completely gone off the rails uh, completely away from every fundamental belief uh, that the party claimed to believe in, um, where they're actually punishing people from Brad Raffensperger out in Georgia to, you know, Cindy McCain and others in, in Arizona, anyone who's, you know, Liz Cheney getting kicked out, she's the apostate, people who are actually standing up for democracy, for constitutional law, they're the apostates. It's, it, what do you think what do you think the turning point was for the Republicans? Because I spent 27 years in the Republican Party, and I could not believe how many egregious things they let Donald Trump and his enablers get away with that were so anathema to everything Republicans claimed. And it wasn't just at a national level. This is now cascaded down to state and local levels, which I don't know that the American people realize the threat that's there also. Where do you think the turn was? Uh, first of all, I'm, I'm not even sure it's cascading from above. I think it is coming up from below. I think this Fair. is now a, a grassroots authoritarian turn. This is not just Ms. Mitch McConnell or Trump. It is very much coming. Net, politicians in Washington, Republican politicians, are responding to the, the, the grassroots, to party activists in Texas and in Arizona and in Georgia and in Oregon and other places. So this is a really bottom-up phenomenon. I, I'm not sure there was a single turning point, Tara. I think there were multiple ones. I think that Republican politicians learned over time. First of all, Donald Trump crossed certain lines that nobody was, for good reason, nobody in a generation in Republican politics was willing to cross in terms of racism, in terms of nativism, in terms of breaking certain norms. During the campaign, he crossed all these lines that no one, not even the most extreme right-wing Republican would do. And, he, and it worked. That was lesson number one. Lesson number two was the um, the Jeff Flake lesson that, or the Bob Corker, Corker lesson. Any mainstream Republican politician who stood up to Trump, who openly challenged Trump, would see their political career destroyed. That was another really important lesson. Mm -hmm. um, there, there were a series of lessons along the way where we learned that Donald Trump really could stand up and shoot someone on Fifth Avenue and, and, and not lose any support. Republicans yep. learned that. Yep. But most, most frightening of all for me, and I, I think if there's a single turning point into real dangerous authoritarianism, it's what happens after January 6th. After January 6th, uh, the Republican leaders took a time out for a day or two, sort of put their finger to the wind, looked at polls, and realized that Trump still hadn't lost any support. Something that mm -hmm. I could not have dreamed of happening. I wrote a book called How Democracies Die, and when we wrote it, I couldn't have imagined what happened on January 6th, happening in the United States of America. It happened 
Republican leaders looked around, realized the base was still in the same place and decided that they had to go along. And at that, at that point, in between, just to finish up the answer, the, the two month period in between the election and, and January, when Donald Trump tried for two months openly, openly to overturn the election, Republicans learned that not only would they not pay a price for trying to overturn an election, but they would be rewarded by their base for doing so. That lesson is still, the, the, the consequences of that lesson are to be played out in the three years to come. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Nameless had, uh, was very interested in your answer. Had a, uh, had a cat uh, sighting. <laughs> Usually it's Tiki, but I locked Tiki up tonight. Uh, Nameless has taken taken the spotlight tonight. Um, it's, it's, usually, it's only pets that usually are interested in what I got to say. So, I, 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 well, same. same, right, right. Um, so, Stephen, you know, it's. It, I'm glad you brought up the the idea that it was actually from the bottom up because you're right. A lot of time, I've spent a lot of time in Washington, so oftentimes I look at things from the federal level and then from federal how it how it uh, cascades down to the grassroots. But you are right; it is actually from the ground up in this case. They are responding to what they see in the ground, and if people notice, I have my I voted sticker on today because I live in Virginia and we're one of the off year. Uh, states that have gubernatorial elections and state uh, state and local elections, us in New Jersey, my home state. Um, and I think that this whole era has really uh, reignited people's interest in civics and in state and local races, because after, after November, when we saw how Trump tried to steal the election um, and all the hijinks that they were pulling and the pressure he was putting on state uh, office holders like Raffensperger in in Georgia and those folks out in Arizona and and the and the guy up in Michigan I can't think of his name right now the the canvas the state board of canvas uh, canvas guy that that bravely yeah. voted down um, them trying to not certify the election but if we if people explain to the American people how these things happen under their noses if they're not engaged at a state and local level because it now it matters more than ever. The presidency and the and the congressional and senate races get all the shine, and a lot of people, you know, you don't have turnout for these local elections. But look at how crucial these people are in these positions, like Secretary of State and others, when it comes to the the next election cycle. These guys could try to steal the elections away, and then what happens to democracy? We could lose it. Um, I, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, the, democracy. One of the themes of our of our book is that democracies die today in a way that's very different from the way most of us think of it. It's not, it's not going to be general seizing power. It's not going to be like January 6th with armed militias seizing the Capitol. It's going to take place probably at the ballot box. It's going to take place in ways that are deemed by many people to be legal and constitutional. It's, it's going to be in, in, in steps. It's going to be slow. It's going to be subtle. And sit, many citizens, citizens who are not paying attention, are going to miss it. And so you're absolutely right. Things that are not just elections at the local level, but reforms at the local level, reforms that now enable some state legislatures or state election officials to bypass local election officials to uh, and, and potentially overturn results or throw out ballots of uh, rival party in, in, in rival strongholds. These steps are, are taking place today, right under our, our watch in ways that are that are legal, that are technically legal, or could be deemed legal, that could enable the outright theft of an election, meaning the, 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 the electorate votes one way, and the outcome, who wins power, is, is another way. And um, the good news is that the press is reporting this stuff more than ever before, and citizens are paying attention to what's going on. I mean, rarely in American history have American citizens had to concern themselves with legislative reforms in, in states across the country. That's but they true. are, and they have to be. We have to be paying attention. Absolutely. It's not, it's never healthy for democracy. We we shouldn't have to spend two, three, four hours a day consuming news about the state of our democracy. That's a sign that things are pretty out of whack. But we are. Citizens are beginning to pay attention. They're voting more, they're they're reading more, they're participating more, and that's crucial if we're going to save democracy. Absolutely. 
So true. Go ahead, Rick, and then we're going to take a break. I was just going to say, I think I think that's it's it's a luxury good and it's a stable society to not worry about politics every day. Right. We are increasingly in a country where you have to worry about politics every day. It's much more consequential. It's much more it's much more physically uh, imminent in a lot of places, and it's it's much more dangerous now. Uh, as we go into a, an era where political violence is being mainstreamed, uh, particularly in the Republican Party. Yeah, no. And it's exhausting. It's exhausting for citizens. Yes, for sure. it is. And, but, and we don't, and I think that's the point also. They want to exhaust people to the point where they just go, you know what, whatever, and, they, and it becomes normal, right? We, we've warned for a long time here at the Lincoln Project, even before Lincoln Project existed, that none of this is normal. Um, when Rick came to speak to my students up at Harvard, when I was a fellow there last year, the name of our study group the week that Rick was there was no, none of this is normal. And we don't want people to get into that into that mindset where they're just so exhausted, they throw their hands up and go, well, what, what can I do? It, it is what it is. And then next thing you know, your, your freedoms are taken away and you're living in, in an author, authoritarian society and we're trying to prevent that. So Absolutely. when we come back, we will have the exclusive premiere of the latest Lincoln Project ad, which is right in line with everything that we're talking about right now. And we'll get Professor Stephen Levitsky's thoughts on it all, and we'll take your questions. So we'll be right back. Stay tuned. We will never forget them, nor the last time we saw them they've slipped the surly bonds of earth to touch the face of God. Those who are lost now, their legacy must be our lives. They can hear you, and the people who knock these buildings down will hear all of us soon. Amazing grace. dispatching thousands and thousands of heavily armed soldiers. We dominate the streets. I won't traffic in fear and division. I won't fan the flames of hate. It's time to pick up our heads. Remember who we are. This is the United States of America. Paid for by the Lincoln Project, which is responsible for the content of this advertising. And welcome back to The Breakdown. We're here with Stephen Levinsky, a political scientist and professor of government at Harvard University. He's also the co-author of How Democracies Die. So Stephen, we're going to premiere our latest Lincoln Project ad right now, and um, I would love to get your thoughts on it. It's pretty intense, and I think, uh, I think you'll have an interesting reaction to it. Let's roll it. It's called The Line. I want to know why what happened in Minamar can't happen here. No reason. I mean, it, it should happen here. No reason. Right? That's right. America has crossed a line. The Republican Party believes in ending the American experiment, led by a man obsessed with power and money who will say and do anything to seize control again. This election was rigged. To punish those who oppose him. His followers don't just disagree with us. They've got something worse in mind. We know what national populism and authoritarianism lead to every time. That's what this is all about. That's why we will never compromise with this evil. We will never step back from the line because we believe in America. Are you in this fight or have they already won? Good ad. Thank you. You That's guys are it. The best. I don't know. commentary. That's my kind of review. I will get yeah, to comment. We'll take it. I just I want to know what Republicans have in ad making that Democrats just can't quite get. But that's I'll for that's you, for I'll another day. What, I'll give you the thirty second summary. Democrats okay. focus group the hell out of every word. They try to make every constituency happy in every ad. We go for one message, one theme. We we speak from a from a from a, a mental aspect of commitment to the idea we're talking about. 
we go, we go and get it done. They, they try to algorithmically derive the perfect ad that'll appeal to a zillion people. We want to make sure that we're hitting people's emotional uh, you know, states and their amygdalas as hard and as smart as we can. That's the sort of the quick summary. More power to you. I'm, I'm glad you're on our side. Um, Happy to be look, here. Look, I think you, you guys have this ad puts, puts its finger on, on the problem. The, the, the Republican Party and a good chunk of the Republican activist base, not just Donald Trump, not just Michael Flynn, are moving right. away from democracy. They're abandoning the very idea of mm -hmm. democracy. And uh, this is something we've, we've seen with many different political parties of the far right, of the far left, in many parts of the world. When, when, a, when a party grows so extremist that it sees a victory by the other side, by their rivals, as an existential threat, as something that they can't live with, something that's beyond the pale, then they, they adopt a win-at-any-cost mentality. They adopt a, a by-any-means-necessary um, mentality. What, what, it, it's not every day that Republicans are talking about coups in Myanmar, but um, the, the message is very clear that if it takes authoritarianism to preserve their, the, the way they conceive of, 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 uh, of American identity or American way of life or community, so be it. That, that is the level to which Republican extremism has, has reached. And I think there's every reason I think it's going to continue. Absolutely. Absolutely. You, you know, that um, it's, it's hard to fathom, again, as someone who has spent more of my adult life in the Republican Party working for Republicans and the conservative movement to watch this happen, um, because I actually believed them when they quoted uh, the founding fathers and Lincoln and Reagan and, you know, um, the, the conservative uh, philosophers that who we formed our ideology around, I actually believed that and I internalized it. So it, it's still mind blowing to me that pure political power and the desire to um, maintain that power is so intoxicating that it overpowers everything else, even defending democracy. It's, it's quite remarkable. Um, but we have a president now in Joe Biden who does respect our democracy, who does respect the Constitution. We don't always have to agree with his policies, but that's secondary. This is a much bigger argument, a much bigger fight um, to, to be had here. And it was rumored that Biden walked around with a copy of your book during the campaign. Um, and he just penned an op-ed over the weekend, um, basically uh, prior to his trip, his first foreign trip for the G7. And um, he talks about the dangers facing democracies, not only he, democracy, not only here, but around the world. We're seeing this happen um, in Western style democracies all over the world. Um, what do you see, you know, what do you see as the solution? How do we reverse this? Because it's not just happening in the United States. How does de how do democracies survive? Tara, if I had the answer to that question, I would have a much better paying job. Um, I, I don't think I don't think there's a single recipe. I don't think there's a single uh, silver bullet. Um, I think there are short, medium, and long term strategies. In the short term, it's really important, uh, as you guys have intimated, to build a broad coalition of small D Democrats and to isolate these guys. So it uh, no matter we may For disagree sure. on foreign policy, we may disagree. On tax policy or healthcare, we need to stand up and isolate extremists who are who are uh, working against democracy, and that's why I'm such a fan of the Lincoln Project, uh, and that's why every day I ask myself, why the hell can't you guys pull more Republicans out of uh, of, of of Trump world? Um, so in the short term, it, it's it's crucial crucial to maintain a broad coalition. In fact, you know, in a different way. The Israeli opposition pulled off. I don't know how long that experiment will last, but that's the that's an example of what has to be done in the short term. In the long run, there is a problem of um, one society. Here, the United States is kind of a vanguard. We are at the cusp for the first time in our history at becoming a truly multiracial democracy. And throughout history, every major step towards a more inclusive democracy generates a reaction, a conservative reaction, sometimes an authoritarian reaction. 
Um, and in part, that's what's been happening in, in the United States really since the civil rights era, as we've moved toward a more inclusive democracy. That's generated a, a reaction. Europe has a lot less experience with diversity than we do, but they have also uh, experienced large scale immigration in the last few decades, and they're gonna face similar reactions, similar processes. So our, we're sort of at the, at, the, at the vanguard, and if we can figure it out, if we can beat back this authoritarian reaction and actually establish ourselves as, as a truly multiracial democracy, and I don't think we're that far from it, um, we can be a model again. You know, you talk, I just, we just talked about Europe, um, but you also have some thoughts about what's going on in Latin America, speaking of immigration. Um, and a lot of focus has been on the, you know, immigration that's happening at the border and, you know, border security and, and the mess that's happening there. But the vice president is down there in Latin America. Um, she was in Guatemala. Um, but there's some stuff happening in that Northern Triangle area and in Nicaragua. You know, these have been hotbed places for for decades that kind of simmered a little bit and, you know, things are starting to emerge again that I think is getting overshadowed by what's happening in other places. Um, talk a little bit about why we should care about what's happening in Nicaragua again. Well, a couple of, of reasons. One, um, the United States as is, is always in a, in a better places, in better shape when more of the world and particularly more of the hemisphere is democratic. Our interests are served where, when the world is, 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 is more democratic. So the, the democratic backsliding in places like Nicaragua and El Salvador and Honduras um, doesn't have a direct impact on the United States, but it creates a world that is less free uh, and a, a world that's less democratic. Um, the, the, the problems in Central America are pretty different from those here, in fact, but they're related because um, there is a, a massive spike over the last generation of criminal violence in, in Central America that is related to the United States in a couple of ways. The primary one is our demand for drugs. This is, mm -hmm. this is trafficking of, of drugs through Central America across the Mexican border to, uh, to the United States. And so um, also, of course, the supply of guns from the United States makes violent crime in Central America and Mexico much easier. So it's intimately related. But, um, you know, when you have, you have levels of violent crime in El Salvador and Honduras that are in most years more than 10 times that of the United States. And the United States is the most violent country in the industrialized world. So th these, these are unlivable levels of violence, which is one of the reasons you're seeing flows of migrants to, uh, to the United States. It's, it's primarily fleeing an unlivable situation where gangs are um, threatening people's kids, right? They're sending their kids <laughs> They're, they're boys up to, some, to, to the United States to avoid those kids getting abducted, threatened, and killed. It's a complicated sure. situation. It's multifaceted and, you know, uh, on both sides of the border, there's a lot of, a lot of uh, finger pointing and a lot of changes that need to happen on both sides. Um, but I thought it was important to, for people to hear that because this is an ongoing issue. It impacts our country. Our vice president is down there now. And um, I knew that you, you have a, a particular interest in what happens in Latin America as well as part of your studies at Harvard. So, um, Stephen Levitsky, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much, Stephen. Um, next time I'm up in Cambridge, I hope that we can, we can get together and uh, kvetch a little bit more about how to save our democracy from dying. <laughs> and I encourage everyone to please, please check out uh, Stephen's book with his co-author, uh, How Democracies Die. It is very instructive. Um, and uh, everyone should read it. It is more important now than ever. Thank you for joining us, Stephen. I hope Tremendous. we can have you back soon. Thanks for having me. Take care. Thanks so much. All right. Now that we have thoroughly depressed everyone about democracy dying, <laughs> no, we're fighting to save it. It can be saved. It can be saved. Um, we're going to take audience questions. So let's see it. What have you asked us tonight on the Twitters? All right, liberal hag, <laughs> uh, the right listens to us and then uses our words against us. How do we fight this, Rick Wilson? Use different words. <laughs> Use different words. Don't play to your audience, play to the audience that you need to convince. Don't get into the trap 
where when you know they're going to use it as part of a distorted caricature of your policies and positions, don't use their language. I really recommend a book written back in the 90s by a guy named David Kuznick called Speaking American. Mm. He was one of Bill Clinton's speechwriters, and he had a tremendous insight into kind of middle-class language and middle-class values. And Clinton reflected those in his campaigns and his governance yep. in a way that was very persuasive to middle class and Republican leaning voters. He wasn't after the base. Democrats very often speak directly to the to the edges of the base and not to the center and the swing. That's right. Um, that's what that was uh, Bill Clinton's secret sauce back in the 90s. And Republicans, yep. he took some lessons from Republicans on policy prescriptions and but he used the language of everyday right. folks which made him relatable um and donald trump did something similar but the type of language that he used and the common denominators right. the lowest common denominators that he used were um the worst of us not the best of us which was quite different than what bill right. clinton did and here we are all right what's next who's rude it's good to see that not all Republicans are on the Trump crazy train, but how do we derail this train and get back on our feet? That is well. that is our work every single <laughs> every day. day. That yes. is what we're doing. Look, we set out in 2020 and we said it very clearly. We're going to defeat Trump. We're going to defeat some of his enablers and we're going to go after Trumpism. We did not succeed in taking out Trumpism. It is still out there. Now, it is a it is a disease by 100 names. It is something that is always present in our body politic. It's always looking for a new host. And he was a magnificent host for it and still is. But that national populism is a danger to this country. And it is an authoritarianism is a danger to this country that is truly existential. They only need to win one election. That's right. And that's the ball game. So that's why we fight. That's the mission we're on. You know, and we're doing it in a, in a dozen different ways. We're playing the psychological warfare angle against their leadership and their donors. We're setting the narrative in the public space. We're being competitive in, the, in races where we can make a difference. And, and we're doing it all in a way that is teaching people how to get in this fight and how to effectively advocate and how to effectively speak to, to voters they need to get to and how to effectively stand up and be bold in a time when withdrawal silence and cowardice are rewarded very frequently mm -hmm. but that's what bullies want you to do okay that's what bullies need you to do they need they, they want to keep punching you and telling you to sh sit down and shut up and do what you're told well you know we all know this lesson we've all learned this lesson over our lifetimes eventually you get up off your off your ass and you smack the bully in the face and you that's hit him right. as hard as you possibly can and he may beat your ass after that but you know what he has learned that you will fight back and if you fight back and you strive to, to uphold the values of this country, the battle becomes that much easier. We have something worth defending here. We have something worth saving here. And that's why we do this mission every day. That's right. And hold them accountable. Remember, these bastards work for us. They mm -hmm. work for me and you. They are only where they are because of who votes them into office. And I mm -hmm. firmly believe that there are a lot more of us than there are of them if everyone is engaged, which is why we continue to encourage people to understand that their vote counts, their civic duty, um, their civic engagement matters. And yeah. it's not just for you, you, your neighbor, your family members. It, this will literally take all of us to, to beat this force back yeah. because it is a force. And it's greater than we realize. And if you if they catch us sleeping at the switch, this will be a different country that we don't recognize. And so we fight this. We work so hard every day to keep up this fight and to encourage others and to inform and um, uh, you know pour into other Americans to let them know that you don't have to be in Washington. You don't have to be in a position like we are to make a difference. You can make a difference right in your own community, in your own town, in your own state races, whether it's for or you know city council or for secretary of state or for Congress. Every part matters every bit of it and every vote matters if we if the last election didn't convince you of that i don't know what will all right i think we have uh some voicemails rick we get to hear some voices yeah yes. all right hi this is james from washington dc i would like to know if you think uh president biden is being too much of a bystander 
when it comes to passing voting rights. Given the challenges that um, states are passing voting restrictions along the country, I'd love your opinion. Thank you, and have a great day. Well, look, I, I think Joe Biden recognizes we have a problem in D.C. right now in his party. He has a bare majority in the Senate. He's got a 50-vote majority with, with Vice President Harris as the tiebreaker. Now, in the Senate rules of today, the filibuster makes it virtually impossible for these guys to actually go out and do something. Um, he would be better served, I think, if Chuck Schumer was a more combat-oriented leader. And if a lot of the people in D.C. around the sort of apparatus weren't convinced that you can go out and run 2021 or 2022 uh, on health care. A lot of people think you're going to go win, win this election on health care. Right. I'd just like to point out they're out of their goddamn minds. This will be an election that is a referendum on whether we are going to live in an authoritarian nation or not. They need to get their heads on that. Biden, I think, does have his head on it, but he is also a very savvy Washington player. He's a very canny, old school guy. He understands that he's going to save a lot of his relationship cards um, with these members of the Republicans' side till the, till the last dog dies. And he also, again, he faces a very difficult problem. Mitch McConnell is much better at politics than Chuck Schumer. He, he is, is a master of it. He is, whether you love, love or McConnell him. or hate him, you've <laughs> yeah. got to know he's really good at it. And yep. so that's the, and that's, the, that's the problem. And he's got people around him who are the most powerful people in D.C. Who have, who, have, you know, who have convinced corporate America to get back on board. And so they've got money and they've got resources and they're putting up a hell of a fight. But I think Biden's, I think he's engaged on it. And I think he also knows politically this can be a weapon in his hands to go out and talk to voters across the country in suburban districts, in swing states and swing areas to say to them, is this being done in your name? That's right. Do you love this or do you reject this? So be rest assured that there is a strategy involved here. Joe Biden has been in politics for 45, 50 years now, mm -hmm. and um, he understands how these things work. You can't get sucked in to some of the more vocal uh, progressive wing of the Democratic Party that you know wants everything to happen now. It's very similar to the Tea Party back in 2010, who demanded yep. they wanted all these things now. You know, they came in there very zealous, overzealous, not understanding how what it takes to actually govern. Joe Biden knows what it takes to govern. It may not be happening as quickly as you would like, but these things don't move quickly um, if you want to actually get them done. So. I wouldn't say that he's a bystander. I, um, I'd say that he's engaging in very shrewd political brinkmanship, which more Democrats, more Democrats should take notice of. All right, we have one more voicemail before we go to break. Hi, Dean, Royal Oak, Michigan. What happens to disaffected GOP voters if Trump becomes the nominee? Do they go to the uh, Libertarian Party or some other third party? Thanks. <laughs> Look, <laughs> this is a great question. Yeah. Depends in some ways on what state they're in. Yep. American politics is largely a two a two party operation. There is not at this moment a home where most disaffected Republicans feel comfortable. They're not really comfortable in the Libertarian Party. Um, there's not really a place for them to land yet. Maybe someday there will be. But uh, at the moment, we have to be realistic about what we face, and it's largely yeah. going to be a binary choice. So we have to give Republicans who are, who are disaffected by Trump um, and who are pushed away from him a soft place to land, because neither side in this country can win with just their base. You've got to have, you gotta do base plus. It's true. And I, you know, as a person who is a disaffected Republican that had to leave the party as a result of it, I've been voting in Demo I voted in a Democratic primary today. It was it's still weird for me, <laughs> you know. I after it's still I'm like when they when I walked into the voting um, the polling place, they ask you for your ID, they ask you your name, and the guy was like, "You're here to vote in the Democratic primary, correct?" And I was like, "Yes." <laughs> I, mean, you know, I, you know, I had to think about it for a second. I'm like, I, "Yeah," but that's what we've had to do in order to. Um, 
push these Republicans out. Now, I'm not saying that I would never vote for a Republican again on a state or local level or even federal if they're not insane. But we have to kind of right. push aside our policy differences in order to put people in office who will not be anti-democratic. That's the bottom line. That's all that matters right now to me. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, not everybody may get there, but that's what it's going to take now. So um, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we have a really cool segment where I get to ask Rick Wilson some flying questions. So stay <laughs> tuned. We'll be right back. We're going to talk about some cool flying stuff. Our country is being destroyed before our very own eyes. Pretty much everybody agreed that segregation was the worst thing this country ever did. Florida is hosting the largest concert since the pandemic began. And the only reason we're doing that is because Florida chose freedom over Fauciism. Together we're going to defund our freedoms. The enumerated powers the federal government has are incredibly limited. We're supposed to make sure that we don't get attacked by any foreign entities. We can negotiate trade deals overseas. We can take care of infrastructure. Aside from that, that's about it. I've been sleeping on my pillows for some time. I love them. But I just found out that they also have a wide assortment of other incredible products like their mattress top, sheets, towels, and slippers. Ah, oh, shit, we failed. All right, so before we leave tonight, we wanna to talk about an out of this world story. If you guys have been watching us consistently and you know that we're obsessed with cool space shit, whether it's rockets <laughs> or planes or satellites or whatever, um, we like to talk about it here because it is indicative of how awesome human ingenuity actually is. That's why we fight for this really cool world, right? So what's the story tonight, Rick? It is about United getting involved with the supersonic jet Stuff. Yes. They have bought these new supersonic jets, 15 of them, from this company called Boom Supersonic. I don't know if that's the best name for it, for a plane, boom, but whatever. I get it where they're going, the boom supersonic thing. Um, but they, their hope is to fly passengers faster than the speed of sound by 2029. Um, right. You know, remember the days of the Concorde? Well, they're kind of bringing that back and then some. Um, let's take a look at this thing. It's pretty cool. All right, Captain this is in the Wilson. category I call shut up and take my money. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Think about hey, that. A three, about and a, this, half hour, a three and a half hour flight from Newark to London. Get that out of here. A six amazing. hour flight from, from San Francisco to, to, to Narita. It's like a 17 hour hop normally. I mean, yes. look, folks, that's super Japan, sonic flights. Folks. We had it in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and uh, up, up until about 2000, I guess it was 2002 when the last Concorde was taken out of service. And it was, you know, it was 60s technology. It was still a marvel of engineering. Mm -hmm. This shit is in that looks fast, <laughs> goes fast category. Looks and like the I space think show. we're going to, well, it, you know, the, 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 the plan form shape of supersonic wings tends to all be the same because of some aerodynamic principles. Mm -hmm. um, but we're talking now about an aircraft that's going to be made much, much more of carbon fiber. Um, you know, much more technologically advanced flight control systems are going to be modern. Um, I am just super jazzed about this. And, you know, and Boom Aerospace has a lot of great people inside the team that are that are developing this thing. And I got to tell you, 
I don't know what it's going to take to get the 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 a check ride on one of those bad boys, but <laughs> you know you're gonna. I, I suspect that a lot of guys line pilots are going to be competing for that one because you know you get a type rating in the supersonic jet. That's that's something to put in your logbook right there. Right. So you're you're only a couple hours away from uh, commercial <laughs> pilot's license, right? So I'm you getting know, there. Like, yep. Right. Imagine what, what do you think it would be like to fly something like that? Well, you know, here's the thing. That's a plane you have to think way ahead of the airplane because, you know, they're flying over the Atlantic and their descent planning starts about midway over the ocean, not not 50 miles from the airport, but, right. you know, 500 miles from the airport. It turns slow. It, it flies fast, but turns slow. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you've got a, you've got a lot of, of long range considerations that, that we say in pilot flying all the time, be ahead of the airplane, know what you're going to do next. Those guys are going to have to be way ahead of the airplane all the time, but you know we've got. I, I think there's a market for it because look, if you're gonna if you're gonna spend five thousand dollars on a ticket to to fly one way, you might as well fly where it's fast, comfortable, yeah. sixty thousand feet, and cool as hell. <laughs> Why not? Right? Shut up and take my money. Shut up. I and will take be my on. Money. I will be on flight supersonic rick wilson this is captain wilson speaking <laughs> this is captain wilson speaking we'll be flying at sixty thousand feet today please keep your hands and arms inside the aircraft at all times <laughs> that's right oh my goodness pretty cool stuff so nice um that's it for our show tonight we want to thank everybody for watching and for our call to action tonight we really just want you to know that the fight is a good fight to fight. And we want you all to join us. So if you did not see our ad or if you missed it earlier, the, the preview of the line, which will be um, for everyone's viewing tomorrow, um, we encourage you to watch it again because- um, It's going America's up on really television gone. on Thursday. Yes, yes, that's right. It, this will be widely distributed because we feel that yep. passionately about this. Because if you haven't noticed, America is really beyond the line. January 6th and the events after that, have really taken us up to that line and beyond. And we've got yep. to fight back in order to save our democracy. So that's our call to action. We want you guys to send us at hashtag ask the breakdown. Let us know what you're doing or what you've been, in, what inspired you to get involved in fighting back to strengthen democracy in your own community. We wanna hear from you. So you can tweet at us or leave us a voicemail because we have the new voicemail. I think we have the number. We can put it up one more time for you. Uh, leave us a voicemail with what you're doing to strengthen democracy in your own community. We wanna hear from you. So that's it for our show tonight. Thank you so much. Watch, um, we're speaking tomorrow night and check out our podcast. Yep. Everywhere you get podcasts, the Lincoln Project podcast is out Oh, and by now. the way, the, today's yes. podcast is hot. <laughs> Uh-oh, uh-oh. It's hot. It, 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 involves a, it, it involves a discussion about jorts. So <laughs> oh yeah, I'm going to leave it right there. I'll leave it right there. But were there and, balls and, involved? As one should <laughs> in the jort situation. That's I may it. be we're wearing jorts right away. now, but I'll never tell. Oh, God. <laughs> we're, we're not giving it all away. Listen to the podcast. We'll see you all on Thursday. Have a good, good night, night, folks. <laughs>